Okay, so this evening we are going to do a flight in the Cessna C-172 Skyhawk in Flight Simulator. Uh, this is the basic, sim the basic Cessna that comes with the basic version of Flight Simulator with the G-1000 radio installed. We are going to look at the autopilot, at VOR radio navigation and at ILS. So we'll have a fly around and we'll explain things as we go because it's much easier to explain while you're flying and seeing things moving on the displays than it is to just sit on the ground and explain. Okay, so we'll go inside the aircraft. We're ready to go on the runway. Let's go and have a look at Little Nav Map, which is a fantastic free navigation application that we've got running alongside the simulator. We are at Provincetown Municipal on Cape Cod. Okay, and the reason I've chosen this is because there is one VOR station not very far away and there's a runway with ILS. So I've got the, the weather pre-programmed to a few clouds, so we've got a nice calm day. So we don't have to worry about too much in terms of what's going on around us. Okay, so let's get in the air, shall we? So have we got the parking brake on? Let's remove the yoke out of the way because we're going to need these buttons anyway during the flight. The parking brake is on, so this is pulled out so we will release that and the pedals are now usable okay so let's go and get in the air and see how we get on so full throttle and we're rolling flaps are at takeoff position already so we don't have to worry about that so I'm just using a small amount of right rudder to counter the torque from the engine steering Stay on the centre line, coming through 70 knots and rotate, and we're in the air. So it really is that simple with a Cessna. Okay, so I'm going to raise the flaps. And I'm going to very quickly go and switch the autopilot on, and I'll explain what I'm doing afterwards. So I'm going to press the heading button, which or the heading roller which moves the heading marker around to the direction we're going. And now I'm going to press the autopilot button and let go. So as soon as I pressed the autopilot button, it lit up with AP here, and it said roll and pit. So that means roll and pitch mode. So that means whatever attitude the aircraft was at at the time I pressed it, it will maintain. So you can see I was slightly banking left, which means I'm slowly turning left. If I press HDG, the autopilot goes into heading mode and it will follow that heading marker. So it's important that I selected, I pressed the heading marker to align it with the direction of the runway I was originally flying. Notice we're still climbing though at whatever pitch angle we were at when we took off, which is fine. So let's go and just check outside the window. Flaps are up. So we have got, we're just climbing aimlessly away from the runway. So let's go and give the aircraft an altitude to climb to. Now we could press ALT and that will say altitude and it will go to the height near where we were already at and it means altitude hold. Yeah. So when, as soon as you press altitude hold the aeroplane will stabilize at the altitude you are at when you press it. If we wanted to go to a specific height, say two and a half thousand feet for example, I can use the ALT knob here and it will change the target altitude above the altitude ribbon. So if I roll that, you can see it's flashing when I did it. So two and a half thousand feet I've gone for, so I've used the outer ring for thousands, the inner ring for hundreds, and I've chosen I want to fly to two and a half thousand feet, but notice it's not doing anything yet. So I have to go to vertical speed mode to get there, and it still isn't doing anything because I haven't told it the vertical speed to travel at, you know, how steeply to climb. So that's what the nose up and nose down buttons are for. So if I press the nose up, nose up button once, it's increased to 100 on the vertical speed indicator, meaning we are climbing at 100 feet per minute. So if I keep pressing it, it will increase each time. So we're now climbing at 500 feet per minute. So 1500, so there's a thousand feet to go. So in one minute's time, or two minutes time, sorry, we should be at two and a half thousand feet. So we can go and look at the map. 
and see the results of that happening. So Little Lab Map's great for us today because it shows you the plot. So that's where we started to drift. Then we hit heading mode and we're flying the, the heading we took off from. And we're climbing slowly to two and a half thousand feet. Okay, so while we're climbing, we could actually change direction, because remember we are in heading mode. So if we roll the heading knob, the small blue marker on the compass rose, the, this is the CDI by the way, we'll get into all of this later. This small blue marker will move as we roll this, and that's the target for the heading. So if we went to 210 degrees for example, or let's go around to south, let's fly directly south. So we can, the target is 180 degrees. So the aeroplane is naturally following that target look and it's flying itself to get there. So AP in the centre here means the autopilot is on in green. If we disengage the autopilot it will flash to warn us that it's off. If we press it again it will switch back on and can continue flying the aircraft for us. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're coming up to 2,000 feet. Let's have a look at the map, see what that plot looks like. So we changed our direction to 180 degrees. Now you'll notice that's not straight down the screen. This is a 180 degrees magnetic and magnetic north and south are not the same as true north and south. Okay? And they vary all over the world by differing degrees. So you have to remember that a compass works on magnetic north and south or magnetic orientation I should say. Okay so this is now flashing meaning we are close to the targets yes yeah? so it, the the target altitude started flashing when we got within a couple of hundred feet of it. Okay and you will see the plane level out and obviously it's starting to accelerate because we're climbing so I'm going to cut the engine back because most of our flying we do today is going to be at two and a half thousand feet as we just fly around. So some of the other things we haven't seen, we saw vertical speed mode, that's how we got to this height. We saw altitude hold mode, we've seen heading mode. That's all we need for the moment. Right, so how much time have we got before we disappear off the screen? Have we got loads? Let's have a talk about this instrument here, or this symbology. This is the course de deviation indicator, and it's showing GPS at the moment which means if we had programmed a flight plan into the... well, you can do it on either screen actually. If we had programmed a flight plan in, it would have followed it by using this instrument in GPS mode. So we could have pressed nav and it would have... the autopilot would have followed our flight plan. But we're not going to do that today. We're going to play with radio navigation to see how it works. So to use radio navigation you have to tune the radios into radio beacons. So what do radio beacons look like on the map? They look like this. There's like a compass rose around them and a frequency number. So this is a VOR radio station. So 114.70 is its frequency. So you can see it says that um, if, we, if we click the CDI button, we can switch it to VOR mode. Yeah, so it's going to follow the VOR radio frequencies or the VOR radio stations. How do we tune that in? VOR1 corresponds with the NAV1 radio. There are two radios, NAV1 and NAV2. If you press CDI again, it switches to VOR2. So it's relating to whatever's tuned in on NAV2. Press it again, it goes to GPS. Press it again, it comes back round to VOR1. So let's go and tune in 114.70 on NAV1 and see what happens. So we can change the integers with the outer ring of the NAV1. The nav knob and then the inner ring will do seven zero so we have changed the standby frequency the actual frequency the radio is currently tuned into is one one zero point five zero so we can switch between those two frequencies so on either of the nav radios you can actually have two frequencies ready at any one time and use this button here to switch between them so I can make the standby frequency the active frequency and vice versa. So if I press it, they swap. And now if we look down, you will see this is saying that it will get to what this means in a moment. I'm going to use a trick on it that will give you an immediate idea of what you can do with a VOR radio. Over here is the course knob and this rotates around that green arrow. 
Yeah, so you can make it point any direction you like. If you press that knob in though, the arrow points directly to the VOR station in relation to us. So we're flying this way. This little aeroplane is flying towards south at the moment. If we were to look behind us and left on the map, behind us and left is the VOR station. And we can prove that. So we can say measure on the map. It's some, somewhere around 65 degrees. Let's do that again. Measure the distance. 65 degrees to the VOR station. And it's, it's closer to 70 on there, but it's because we've already flown along. So if we line this back up so it's in the middle, it's 65 degrees. Yeah, so that gives you a clue of what that green bar is doing in the middle. And so we're going to use that and fly towards the VOR station and see what happens. So with the heading mode, we're going to spin around and fly towards the VOR station. So again, once we get there, so we measured back over here somewhere, didn't we? Measure distance from here, about 62 degrees. Measure distance from here. We want a little bit more. So when we were me when we were talking about it, we were probably there in the sky. There you go. So that was the 65 degree line to the VOR station. So at the moment we're not, we're anything but that. So if we turn the, the course knob until that line lines up, it says actually we need to fly 60 degrees. The course of 60 degrees to go straight towards it. But of course we're not doing that. We are flying at a course of 75 degrees. So we're slowly getting further away from it. Yeah? So one way of getting the aircraft to follow the line at 60 degrees into the VOR station, sorry, at 70, yeah, 60 degrees, would be to press the nav button now. It shows VOR on the autopilot, meaning it's following the VOR. And it's gonna fly across and try and get to the line that is 60 degrees into the VOR station. Which is going to be somewhere over here, isn't it? We could say the 65 degree line. So if we were to say, change that course knob to 65, which was the line we originally drew, that means the line we need to be on is to the left of where we are. So the plane is going to try and intercept it and you can see that happening. Yeah, the line is to the left of our actual path. So if you imagine looking overhead, we're here, the line is over here. So that as we get closer and closer to that line in the sky, the line is lining up in the middle of the arrow. As we get closer to the beacon, this will become more and more obvious what's going on. Something else that's m not too obvious is there are two arrows here. That means that we are measuring in terms of the direction to the beacon from us. Yeah? We can spin this around. So let's put it in heading hold mode for the moment so we can mess around with the course. And we need to press the heading in at the same time. Otherwise the aeroplane starts moving around. We'll press heading again. So we're just going to cruise along this kind of direction and this gives us some freedom now to play with this instrument without it affecting what direction we're going. So if we had done it in nav mode the aeroplane would have started moving as soon as we moved the course. So I'm going to spin this all the way around so rather than hold it I'm going to hold the mouse button down. So rather than spin the mouse wheel forever and a day I'm going to hold the mouse button down and turn this around the opposite direction. And it will suddenly become obvious why there is a compass rose around the VOR. Now notice, when we went past 90 degrees away from our course, the arrow swung to the other end. The second arrow swung to the other end of the needle. So 
So if we turn this round and we roll this a little bit more, so there you go. We are on the about two, four, six degrees from the VOR station. Yeah? So if you measure from the VOR, let me do a measurement. Two, four, six degrees is absolutely dead on look. So that makes sense why there is a compass rose on the VOR itself. Yeah, so if you spin it round, if the arrow is the opposite direction than the course, it's the from reading. So the angle from the VOR. If the both are, the arrows are on the same side, you're thinking in terms of to the VOR from you. Yeah, so the bearing you're reading from the compass rose can either be to the VOR or from the VOR. And it's indicated on this course deviation indicator by this arrow being either the same side as the course or the opposite side of the course. OK, so remember we can just press this in to flick it back round and tell us exactly which direction the VOR station is. So it's at 70 degrees from us. If we press nav, the aeroplane will turn to 70 degrees. And it will actually it will turn beyond 70 to get us back on the line of 70 degrees into the VOR. So a, a phraseology we commonly hear is radials. Radials are typically talked about in terms of from the VOR, yeah, not to. So the radials are the angles from the VOR station. So you you might say you are on the the 70 degree radial for example so if you imagine drawing a line on a map you know 70 degrees can be over there somewhere so we are at the moment if we measure the distance here we are on the 250 degree radial from LFV and we're flying directly towards it Okay, so that's how VORs work. Obviously, you can imagine if you use two VORs in concert with one another, you can triangulate and draw two lines and figure out where you are in the sky, even if you haven't got a map. You know, if, without GPS, for example. So, say you're out of the ocean, you could plot your exact position as long as there are two VOR stations nearby. But you can also do it with one using distance measuring equipment. So, to see that in the G1000, you can go into the primary flight display options and you'll see DME. If you switch that on, NAV1, 114.7 is the frequency, three and a half miles. And we're closing in it, look, 3.4 miles, 3.3 miles. So then if you're looking at a map, you could draw with a pencil a given direction that you've tuned in the VOR, look at the distance measuring equipment, and you can, you know, you just mark off the distance. So that's why it's important on maps that they have the range, because on a paper map you would have a set of dividers with two points. You would line them up and just walk the dividers along the line you've drawn on the map to figure out how many miles away from the VOR station you are. So in that case you only need one VOR station. It's important to point out not all radio stations have distance measuring equipment. And you can just get beacons that only have distance measuring equipment and don't have the, the VOR, you know, with the radials that you can get from them. OK, so we're within a mile. We're going to fly straight over the top and you will see this swing around. Or the, the line will shoot across and the arrow will flick across. So we'll let that happen because it's quite instructive. We'll go to heading mode to see it happen. So get ready, it's going to flick over any moment. We're within a mile now. This is moving away. So we're losing the, the, the alignment with the VOR. And it will be behind us any moment. Half a mile from it and the arrow will flick. So now it has no signal. Give it a second, there it goes. The VOR is now behind us. Yeah, so that's, we're now measuring from, we're 70 degrees from the VOR. 
250 degrees to fly to it. Does that make sense? We can actually help ourselves out on little nav map as well. There's a nice function up here where you can show a compass that's centered on you that shows the compass directions around you. So if you're not too good with angles and it's showing magnetic look, so it's offset by the correct amount for the place in the world you are for the, it's called magnetic deviation. So the, the variation of the difference between the magnetic North Pole and the true North Pole. Okay, so let's go and fly back round and we will go and have a play with the ILS at Provincetown. So in order to get there, we'll go to heading mode and we'll just spin the heading round and we could do a plot on the map here. We could say, remember it's going to take us time to turn. So we'll measure distance and we'll say, well, we want to fly about 263 degrees. So we'll spin the heading round, let's have a look at it, to 263 degrees. It's really, really tedious in Flight Sim to roll the heading knobs. They used to have an acceleration built into them where the faster you rolled your mouse wheel, the more degrees they covered. But they've removed it in one of the updates to the simulator, which is really frustrating. OK, so while we're flying along, we'll explain a few other things. Um, in the G1000, you can press the wind button at the bottom and you get three options. If you press like option number three, for example, it shows you the bearing, or sorry, the direction of the wind and the speed of the wind and a arrow relative to your aircraft of the direction. So it's blowing towards us at four knots. If you press option two, uh, sorry, it's the buttons underneath, isn't it? Option two just shows you an arrow, a relative arrow and a speed. Option one shows us a, it, it resolves the forces across and along the axis of the aircraft. So you can see we've got a headwind of four knots. Yeah, so I actually find option three is the most useful. So you get an indication of the actual direction of the wind and the speed and a relative arrow. And of course you can turn that off as well to declutter the HUD and go back and back again. And that takes you back to the normal view. Also in the PFD menu, you've got DME. We already saw that. You've got the bearing information um, again that's got lots of options so you can that gives you an indication so as you flick around you're seeing nav 1 nav 2 and the GPS so you can have cross-reference information showing you lots of things at once on the HUD if that makes sense so you could have nav 1 and nav 2 tuned in and it could be telling you the angles and then you could plot them on your paper chart if you wanted to um, HSI format is quite a neat one you can say you can have 360 degrees HSI, which is what this is, or you can show arc, which just shows you the top half. Yeah, I actually prefer seeing the whole thing. Um, the rest of it is to do with like the trans. Oh, this ADF. ADF stations are being as automatic direction finder. They're being made uh, obsolete and being shut down all over the place. So there's no point really learning them because it's very rare you ever see ADF anymore out in the wild. Well, there are some other people out flying. Interesting. So we're still chugging along. If you see, look, we're pretty much following parallel to the route. So we did the turn a bit tighter than I imagined. We scribbled all over the map. So in a few minutes, we'll be in range to turn in and see what the ILS does. So instrument landing system, ILS, is the same technology as the VOR radios, except it um, can measure your vertical position as well as your, um, lat your lateral position relative to the frequency. And the course suddenly with um, an ILS radio frequency, the course setting doesn't do anything anymore. It's hardwired to the direction of the runway. So as soon as you tune in on a modern radio to an ILS frequency, it realises it's, it's ILS and the course knob doesn't do anything. On an old-fashioned radio, you still had to go and tune 
you would have to change the course to the direction of the runway yourself. But on these modern electronic ones, they have a database in their head. And they know when you tune into a, the localizer, they know all about it. It's like you saw the frequency appear. There's, there's data that comes down the radio with it. Like it's got LFV, it knows that that was the LFV VOR station. Okay, so while we're flying along, we'll have a look at, we looked at altitude hold. So just in the same way we, we climbed to two and a half thousand feet, if we wanted to come back down, we could roll the altitude knob to say 1500 feet. So you can see the target altitude has changed. Then we can press VS for vertical speed. And then we can say nose down at 500 feet a minute. So you can see the aircraft is accelerating and we are going down. I'm going to cut the throttle a little bit to stop us accelerating too much. And you can see the altitude dropping at 500 feet a minute. So this is our vertical speed, our actual vertical speed. That's the target vertical speed. This is our actual altitude. This is the target altitude. And then you've got the barometric pressure at the bottom of the altitude ribbon. So I'm not sure if we talked about that already, about barometric pressure. The altimeter works by measuring air pressure. Um, and you can therefore change the barometric pressure. So you can see it here. Uh, it's the outer ring of this knob, the course knob. The outer ring is barometric pressure. So it, it won't make much sense until we get to 1500 feet, so I'll leave it alone for the moment. Just reset it back to what it was on, and then I'll explain what it does. But basically, yeah, the altimeter works by measuring air pressure, but air pressure varies with the weather. So the barometric pressure of the air varies with the, with the, um, the weather, you know, and how hot it is and lots of other factors. So whenever you get near an airfield, we need to speed back up again, don't we? Whenever you get near an airfield, you can contact the airfield and they will give you their meteorological data, the METAR report, and they will tell you the barometric pressure to set your altimeter to. There we go, we're just coming down to 1500 feet, so the plane is starting to level out all on its own. You can see there's a marker on the altitude ribbon that also reflects the target altitude. So once we've leveled out, I'll show you what difference that makes. So at the moment, it's at 29.92 inches, which is kind of the US format for measuring the, the barometric pressure. In Europe, they tend to use hectopascals, which is a different, it's a bit like the difference between um, Celsius and Fahrenheit. Two different gauges, but it's measuring the same thing. Okay, so we're just coming down to 1500 feet. So let's go and roll that barometric pressure and change it. So let's roll it up to 3000. Look at the height changing. So the height the aircraft thinks it's at just changed. Because the aircraft is not measuring the ground, it's not looking at the ground. It's working out from the air pressure how high it thinks it is above the ground. Yeah? So therefore it's important if you're on a long journey that you get the METAR information along the way and it, most importantly at the destination airfield so your charts agree with the actual, you know, with the heights that the, the altimeter is telling you. Otherwise there could be a discrepancy and you could hit the ground or you know, hit a hill or all sorts of things could happen. Okay, so let's have a look at the map and see where we are. With, we can see now we are 10.2 miles away from Nav 1. So let's do a distance measurement and read it. So measure distance. 10.4 miles by the time I got around to doing that because we're actually moving qu uh, quite a clip across the ground. So we're going to turn now. Let's have a look, see what sort of direction we want to go. About 320 degrees would probably be quite good. So let's turn the heading. We're still in heading mode on the autopilot we will turn to 320 degrees. When we get into the ILS, I will start hand-flying the aeroplane because I want to illustrate what is going on. 
there we go we're flying towards the ILS so we need to change the radio to 111.10 so while we're doing this let's go and declutter the map so in little nav map let's go and remove all of the things we've drawn so all we're left with is our plot so we can even get rid of that and make it start again with our plot of where we've been flying so it's now going to draw it behind us as we fly towards the ILS so we needed to change nav1 to 111.10 so we can change the standby frequency to 111.10 and then we switch the frequencies to make that the active and you can see it says lock one it knows it's a localizer in other words it's the ILS frequency okay so I'm going to turn more towards the airfield let's turn directly north now remembering that's magnetic north so remember I said the course knob won't do anything if you're tuned into a localizer to an ILS frequency so you can see the course knob is not rotating the green arrow what the green arrow is showing us is the direction of the runway relative to us yeah so if we zoom in a bit here you can see there's the runway the runway is at that angle from our direction of travel yeah so I'm going to turn another 20 degrees because I want to illustrate something and I don't want it to happen too quickly so the green line being away from the left arrow means the the line to the runway is to the left of us we'll go more of an angle so let's go at 50, 40 degrees I just want to cross it at quite a shallow angle so you see it sweep across and it's already moving I think so we're coming across the line so here comes the line when we're on the line it will be in the middle so at the moment it means we are to the right of the line which we are and then we cross over it we are now to the left of the line and we are to the left of the line you will also notice this extra piece of symbology has appeared this is our vertical position in relation to the glide slope down to the runway so when this green when the green diamond is in the middle it means we're absolutely on the right place in the sky at this distance from the airfield yeah so if we turn back away from the runway so we're going to turn the heading back to say 300 degrees or just well actually we can go the absolute opposite direction it really doesn't matter to fly the exact opposite direction than the, run the runway so we're just flying away from it yeah so we're turning away so the runway is the opposite direction and we are to the right of the line there's the line we're to the right of it relative to us yeah and you will notice as we get further away that green dot's getting higher and higher again because the further away from the runway if you imagine this is an invisible line through the sky that descends down towards the apron of the runway this is higher the further we get away from the airfield the higher that line is in the sky but we are staying at 1500 feet so the line is now above us as we turn around it will make a lot more sense so we're going to do a left turn when we get further out and we'll spin the heading all the way around in fact I'm going to come off the autopilot now and do this all by hand okay so I'm going to press the autopilot button to disengage it so I'm flying now so I need to see outside and see the instruments because it's much easier just to fly this and explain it as we go So you can see as we're, we're now flying back towards the runway which is over on the left side of this island somewhere there it is over there so you can see we are going to intersect the line so i'm just going to trim us out slightly there we 
go. So we are going to intersect that line. We're flying towards the line, which you can see is happening, look. We can also see the green dot is lowering. In other words, we are coming up to the point, if you imagine a dot, a line through the sky that we can't see, we're about to fly right through the middle of it in a, from a vertical perspective. If we dive, we can go below it. If we pull back up, we'll go above it. The closer we get to the airfield, the lower in the sky that line is. Yeah, because it's, it's a, an imaginary line that follows all the way down to that little airfield down there. So we can chase these two instruments to keep the green diamond in the middle and the green line in the middle of the, the CDI. So we're going to come back off the throttle. Because remember we're descending now, otherwise we will overspeed and smash into the wrong way. We don't really want to go more than about 60 knots really. So we're going to go and drop the flaps, but we can't yet. If you look on the indicated airspeed ribbon, there's a white area that starts at 95 knots on the Cessna. That's the point at which it is safe to drop the flaps. So you can see we're off to the left, and there's the runway there. So we are off to the left of the line, of the centre line of the runway. So we're going to pull back, and we are below the glide slope. So I'm waving all over the place on purpose, to be honest just so you get a good indication of what's going on. So there we go, we're now slow enough that we can drop the flaps. So yeah, I'm, we I'm weaving all over the place so you can see the instruments moving. So we're going to fly in. So I'm climbing back up gently to get back onto that glide slope as they call it. So this is the glide slope and this is the localizer. So this gives you your lateral position in you know, relation to the runway over the ground and this gives you your vertical position in the sky relative to the runway. So look, if we just open the engine and we'll climb so we can get you there in a hurry. Here comes the line, it's in the sky. Look, we're approaching it from underneath and now we have almost on it. So if we level out we'll fly through it and now we start flying down towards the runway and try to stay on that imaginary line down towards the end of the runway. So you might think, what is the point of this? Or what if we couldn't see the runway? As long as we know how this works and we've practiced it a few times, we can follow these markers without being able to see the runway. It would help if this enormous tree wasn't in the way though. <laughs> Obviously we can't follow it directly Imagine doing this if you did an instrument approach and you didn't know that tree was there. So we're just going to go just above the tree. So that is a really good example of why you have notes on flight charts. Because the notes might say there's a tree. But in this case it's just a, bit, a piece of bad AI from the simulator. There we go, and we're down. So there you go. Today we covered quite a lot. We looked at the operation of the autopilot. We looked at navigating by VOR radio beacons. And we also looked at how the ILS works, which is kind of re related to the radio beacons. It's just got an extra piece of functionality there to give you your vertical position in the sky as well as your lateral position relative to the, the runway. OK. The flaps and taxi back. I don't think you really want to watch me do the taxiing back, do you? It's not the most exciting thing to see. So I'll just get past the, the hold point for the runway and pull us to a stop. And let's get the parking brakes on and maybe cut the engine. We can, the, a lot of people think you can just turn the magnetos off to cut the engine, the better way to do it is to cut the mixture to the engine because that uses up any fuel that it was running on and doesn't leave any fuel in the engine and then you can go and turn everything off. Obviously we're getting warnings because we're now using the batteries but we can go turn everything off and it will all go dark any moment hopefully if it's going to behave itself. Oh is this a bug in the simulator again? 
How long is it going to last for? We've switched all power off and the avionics off and it's still on. I think we'll call that a bug. That's an interesting one. Anyway, I'm going to stop the video there and I'll see you again soon. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments.